How's it going, everybody? It is your favorite apostates. I am McKay. I am Jordan. And we are back again, going at it this week with the uh, the temple ceremonies, rituals, however you want to call them. Today, we're going to be talking about the ceiling, but a couple things before we get started. Many of you have asked, and we are finally delivering. Well, we aren't delivering more... Mormon Stories Podcast's channel is delivering a uh, Mormon Stories interview featuring yours truly, your favorite apostates. Many of you have asked us when and if we would ever be on Mormon Stories. We have told you many a time that we do not feel like we are cool enough to be on the podcast. Fortunately for us, John DeLynn and Kara Burrell happened to disagree with our stance on that. And asked us to come on the podcast. So we have filmed with them a nine-hour interview. Holy shit. It's a lot. You want to listen to us for nine hours? Do you really love us? So, Do you want to hate us? <laughs> so our Mormon Stories episodes come out next week. No, it's this week. This week. So our Mormon Stories episodes will air... Tuesday, February 1st, Wednesday, February 2nd, and Thursday, February 3rd. It is a three-part episode. It starts with McKay's story, then it comes to mine, and then it goes to our marriage, leaving Mormonism, deconstruction, and starting our YouTube channel. Yeah. So we hope that you will tune in and show out for Mormon stories. We told them we have an amazing audience, so we hope that y'all will migrate over there and watch these interviews. Once they are published, we will link them here. But since they are not published yeah, in yet. The, in the meanwhile, we will just link the Mormon Stories channel. That is youtube.com slash Mormon Stories. You can also search Mormon Stories basically wherever get you, you get your podcasts and you can find us that way. They will premiere on YouTube, though. That's yes. where they will be first. If you are not aware of Mormon Stories, it is probably the biggest Mormon, ex-Mormon podcast um, out there today, period. Easily. Um, so it was truly an honor that they thought we were cool enough to be on there. Yeah. Also, I want to shout out two individuals that work at the local Dutch Bros that we go to that noticed us. So <laughs> if you're watching this, hello, and we'll be back soon. Don't worry. We loved you guys. That was great. <clears throat> um, next order of business. Uh, if you haven't noticed already, Jordan and McKay, Jenna Knights confirmed. Jenna Knights confirmed. So in case confirmed. you were wondering... I've had this for a minute, and I was like, oh, I need to wear it. If you're not aware, this is um, Jen's shirt with paying a nice little tribute to Girl Defined, overweight, sexually broken loser. That is me. So if you're not a Fundy Fridays fan, you need to be because we love Jen. So. Jen is awesome. And then uh, with my shirt, if you would like, let me get my microphone moved a little bit. If you would like, I just commissioned this artwork. It is original artwork that I had commissioned and a logo that is original as well. If you would like a metal style Satan's Ponzi scheme logo t-shirt, check out the link in the description with our Teespring. Um, that also with playing with my mic brings me to my next point. Many of you have asked and said, can we please get you to move your mics away from your mouth? Because a lot of us, for accessible, uh, accessibility reasons, um, need to be able to read lips. I understand um, these mics kind of suck, and we are in the process of getting some new ones so that we don't have to have that issue anymore. So um, it is a major upgrade, monetary-wise, so I'm doing my best to scrape the funds together so that we can get that, and then uh, we don't have to worry about that. That's expediting, too. Uh, microphones was pretty low on the list of upgrades for the year, um, so I want to put it at the top so we can accommodate everybody. Anyway, I think that's it. Sorry for the long uh, uh, little intro there, but I think we've got everything out of the way so we can move on to the main event, which is the Mormon Ceiling ceremony also known as a temple wedding in some cases and we will just explain the difference between the two um in this episode all right let's dive in shall we this is probably one of our higher requested videos because we get a lot of questions about mormon weddings so allow us to break down mormon weddings for you so beginning with we are not talking about the ceiling 
like your sealing. We were talking about sealing, like you seal something together. That is what the Mormon wedding ritual is called. It's called a sealing. And so there are kind of a lot of Mormon weird wedding cultural things surrounding preparation for the sealing and kind of just weddings in general that make it kind of unique. Um, so, and we, we've talked about some of these before, so some of this will be redundant, but obviously Mormons get married quickly. <laughs> Why do Mormons get married quickly? You probably already know the answer to this because they want to do it. They're trying to do it. They want to do it. And as a reminder, you have to be worthy, which we'll get to in a minute, in order to participate in a temple ceiling, in a temple wedding. And so if you do it before you're married with your fiance, then you're effed, essentially. Yeah. You cannot participate in a temple wedding. If either one is deemed unworthy, so that could be for a variety of reasons, but doing it is definitely the uh, on the top of the list of exclusionary practices. Top of the list. So stakes are high before your Mormon wedding. Because there's lots of things that could knock you off that list of being able to go to the temple. That includes viewing pornography. That includes masturbating. That includes consuming substances, alcohol, drugs, etc. Not paying your 10% tithe. Not paying also tithing. another one of those. All of those things can disqualify you from being able to get married in the temple. Now, for the Mormons that are going to come in here and be like, me, let me make this very clear. If you are Mormon, you can still get married. Legally, civilly, period. Okay. It doesn't have to be in the temple. But the sealing itself, the ordinance, as we call them, is necessary for salvation. Essentially, to get to the highest kingdom of heaven. Okay. For ex exaltation, not salvation. Not salvation, but exaltation to get into super VIP heaven. Okay. Okay. Uh, just a brief little overview. I'm not going to go too far into it because it's a, a topic in, its, in and of its own. Um, the idea of exaltation as it is explained by Mormons is the idea that you can become as God, which is the wording that they've shifted to rather than becoming a God. And previously, exaltation was synonymous in the uh, normal for lack of a better word, world, as Mormons get their own planet, um, which was not very far off. So. so, not salvation, but you can't get into super VIP heaven without it, which if you're thinking, wait, so you can't get into super VIP Mormon heaven unless you get married in the temple? So what if you never get married? Then you don't get into super VIP heaven. <laughs> yeah. Which sounds kind of crazy, but that's the truth. Yeah, which is also a, a shitty thing because they'll say, oh, well, you can just get married civilly and then you can get sealed. Yeah, so your marriage means nothing until you get sealed, essentially. Um, whether that is in the eyes of God, it really means nothing. It only means that you are legally and lawfully married to each other, which means that you're now allowed to do it. But um, other than that, you get no upgrades until you uh, you get that sealing, whether it's you have to uh, repent, go through the repentance process, which can, f for sexual sins, take up to a year. Mm -hmm. um, or um, whenever you choose to do that, if maybe you weren't feeling so, so good about it and your spouse was and you finally chose to do that, then you finally get the upgrade of being married for time and all eternity and entering into the quote unquote new and is it the quote unquote new and everlasting covenant of marriage in the temple. So, so here's the deal is Mormons will say the temple wedding is key, right? So your temple wedding, it's the most probably one of the most important aspects of Mormonism. You've completed all of the ordinances up to this point. If you've watched our temple series, this is the final ordinance for the regular humans. And so up to this point, if you go and get sealed in the temple, you've done everything. Like you've checked all the boxes, you've completed all the necessary temple ordinances. So you are going to super VIP heaven, right? So that's why the stakes for these are so high. Now, mind you, it's also important to mention that stakes for other family members that are also Mormon are high at this point as well. Because if you are not Mormon and if you do not have a temple recommend and if you have not taken out your endowments or gone through the temple for your endowments, watch our previous videos if you're confused. 
If you have not done that, then you cannot participate in a sealing ceremony for someone else. So for example, my dad is a never Mormon. He's never been Mormon, never has been, never will be. When thank McKay, God. <laughs> thank God. When McKay and I got married in the temple, when we had our sealing, my father could not attend because he's not Mormon. Okay. So if you're not Mormon, you ain't getting in. Point blank, period. Yep. However, if you are Mormon and you don't have a temple recommend, so let's say you're Mormon, you were baptized, you're kind of a Jack Mormon, you don't pay tithing, then you can attend. Even if you're like the mother of the bride, if you're not paying that 10% to the church, you're not getting into the wedding. Yep. Just sit with that for a moment. <laughs> This also applies to Mormons who are faithful and are under the age of 21. If you're under the age of 21 and you have not received your endowment, then you are not allowed to go. Doesn't matter your relation. I have a younger sibling who was not allowed to attend my ceiling. She was too young. Um, and then if you're over the age of 21, obviously you have to, you have to have those meet those requirements as well. But, uh, yeah, the stakes are pretty damn high, and for a a uh, church that says families can asterisk be together forever, they certainly flex that if you uh, aren't all on the same page when it comes to Mormonism, then uh, that asterisk really comes into play on the can be together forever. So, as far as a temple wedding goes, people say temple wedding, but it's like. The ceremony itself is not really a wedding. There's nothing about the ordinance itself, the, what you're doing in the temple. It has really nothing to do with a wedding. It is not really consistent yeah. with wedding, traditional wedding practices. It is very much a singular ordinance that may have one or two things in common, but is not super similar. So when Mormons are saying they're having a temple wedding, it just means that they're actually getting sealed in the temple because that's the most important part. On the day of their wedding. On the day of their wedding. And then they are likely having potentially a ring ceremony or a reception or anything of that sort. So that's another important distinction here to make is Mormons get sealed in a temple, right? They have their temple wedding inside the ceremony. We'll get into that in a minute. But usually for either the younger family members who can't participate or never mow family friends or Jack Mormon family friends who can't participate, they will do something else. So they'll either have a reception, they'll have a ring ceremony, they'll have a, a dinner, a luncheon, something of the sort to kind of compensate for the fact that there were there was a lot of exclusion <laughs> yeah. happening at the time. And so it's pretty common to have some type of thing after the ceiling happens. So for us, we did have a reception. We had a probably more elaborate reception than a lot of Mormons have. Yeah. I, I don't know. That's like. kind of my fa my extended family style. We would, I don't, none of my extended family had receptions and churches and stuff like that. So I, I was a little extra. Jordan is okay? extra. I was a little extra. I had a lot of things in mind. Okay. I was the Pinterest girl that had my wedding planned out since I was like 11. Okay. So I had some things in mind. And when you're Mormon, there's a lot of traditional wedding things that you have to sacrifice because you don't get those experiences. There's no, traditionally, there's no walking down the aisle. There's no father giving away the bride. There's no, um, like, unveiling the face for, like, in front of all your friends and family for the first kiss. Like, they're, traditionally, as far as Mormon weddings go, though, are not common. So our reception was a little more elaborate in that sense. And we had a luncheon after the ceiling. And then we had a night reception that evening. Yeah. And it was more closer to what people would call like an open house situation. Uh, where we There had, was a dinner. There was dinner that was served and stuff. Uh, we had apparently dancing. the food was good. We did dancing and it was held in the Joseph Smith Memorial Building. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, literally right next to the Salt Lake City Temple um, with uh, window views right out to the uh, the temple grounds. Hear me out. Joseph Smith Memorial Building sounds insane, which it is. It's a stupid name. But the building itself, McKay will put up pictures. The building itself is yeah gorgeous. It it's is just a, named after a shithead. So. It is. It's a beautiful building. And so it was an expensive venue. But the biggest piece of that again to center 
the theme that we will kind of you will see emerge here in this video is that if you are Mormon, Mormonism is like the central piece of your of wedding, wedding, of the marriage experience. Like it's not you. You are not the center of your day. It is not you are not the center of your like wedding experience. It is Mormonism. Mormonism is the center and everybody else is just orbiting around Mormonism in a wedding fashion. So yep. we paid extra money for a venue that was literally right outside the temple so that when you looked out the window of the venue, there was this beautiful lit up Salt Lake temple literally right next door. And so again, <laughs> everything centers around Mormonism. We paid for that venue because of the views of the temple. So you don't have to pay for a venue. Again, that was kind of a more unique experience for McKay and I. That is not the norm. More of the norm is using the church building, the regular old Sunday church buildings that Mormons have are more commonly used for dinners and receptions. Um, and this is because you don't have to pay for the church building. You just reserve it. Well, you don't have to pay to use the building. No. But since you have gotten into the temple and you are required to pay your 10%, you are still paying for You're it. You're kind of paying regardless. for it anyway. <laughs> So, but you don't have to pay to like rent the building. And so no. the, the Mormon church buildings, McKay will throw up a picture. I don't know if we've ever shown just like a regular old looking. Yeah. The church regular building. church houses, the meeting houses that anybody can go into. They have a very large, not a huge, but a large gym essentially. in every single one of these buildings, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, yeah. Some of them are like smaller than a basketball court, but uh, like the stake centers and stuff. They'll have wood floors and are full-size basketball court sized. So. so if you are Mormon and you are renting a church building for a reception, post wedding dinner, whatever, you need some room. And so traditionally they will have the reception in the gym. So <laughs> And it, it is a it is a still basketball court. There will still be lines painted on the floor and there will still be basketball hoops <laughs> so i screenshotted some images from a subreddit called r slash mormon weddings and so we are going to glance at these really quickly just so you have an actual idea of what we're looking at okay y'all no sh it, like what you like and if you're happy with your experience there's absolutely nothing wrong with that but when i tell you that some of these look like a fever dream <laughs> it is just too much that is why we have to show you because if we described them to you i don't think that you would believe us okay so so sorry for the listeners we're going to describe as best as we can as best as we can uh, but if you want to go to uh, reddit.com forward slash forward slash r forward slash mormon weddings you can look at some of these and just so this first one is the exact image we're talking about here it is you'll notice the shiny gym floor <laughs> um, which is very obvious. The metal chairs, very yep. cute metal which chairs. Which are also provided by the church building. Those are free. You have the circular tables that are also provided by the church building. Eight foot standard across the board in the United States. And then they have tried nicely to decorate the ceilings with these little billowy things. Little drapey... Uh Almost to make it look like a half tent. <laughs> but the problem, a lot of the, the Mormon church buildings are older. They're, a lot of them are much older buildings. So the wood, like the wood around the building is like 70s type paneling. Oh, yeah. So it's not, <laughs> it's not the cutest thing. But in this one, they really tried. They threw up lights. There's some trees. They threw some ribbon on the brown metal chairs. But it oh big old bows for those. It just is fever dreamish, okay. And mind you, a lot of people they will make uh, to save money because you know you don't have a lot of time to commission people to make things for you. Because if you're like us, we got engaged in September and married in January. Um, you don't have a lot of time to get things to go, so you enlist your fellows in the war to 
maybe pick some decorations up off of them or help them or have you have them help you make your own decorations or things so it's very common for the lady church members um and like relief society which is the women's organization um to like come together and do like a diy wedding decoration type thing which diy can be done tastefully not shitting on diy here but there are some things we had a lot of diy stuff at our wedding too we did there are some things to contend with when you're doing a reception in a gym one of those things is there are basketball hoops in the gym and i think this is one of those like retractable ones too that makes it even sadder some of them are not retractable right so some of them are just they're like fixed positioned in that space and you can't move them some of them are retractable so you can lift them up and they're not like in your way right but in this case i don't know if this one's retractable or not but bless these little people's heart they did like a little arch that's attached to the basketball hoop so it's like tool and flowers and it's like and the tool is uh emanating if you will from the hoop <laughs> of the basketball hoop. it's almost it's like ghastly like it's <laughs> is that the word like it's a, it's kind of like a spooky type look yeah if the flowers were black it would be halloween decoration it would be <laughs> Okay, so they have that, and then obviously you have the floor, and when you're doing, you can't work with the floor. Like, the floor is just shit. It's gym floor, and it has lines on it, and yep. no matter it's what wood. you put on top of it, it's going to be gym floor. Yep. Which is just unfortunate. And I mean, you would have to get an insane amount of material to cover that up. <laughs> seriously, seriously, and at that point, just pay for a venue. And then in this one, you can kind of see the little, these aren't the metal chairs. These, it's a little bit of an upgrade. Oh, the these are the plastic chairs that the they molded have. molded plastic. Love them. In the church building, usually in the Sunday school teaching type rooms. And then this one is very Mormon-esque culture, very cringe. This is a wedding cake that look like flowers barfed on it. And then it has a temple a crystal diamond looking salt lake temple sitting on the top so like i said it can't just be i think my my parents had a christmas ornament that looked exactly like that it was really? it's like um <coughs> as if you were blowing it's like glass art but it's kind of like um i don't even know how to describe it just like cross hatched glass in the shape of this uh, salt lake city temple it's it's horrifying honestly but like I said, this is, you can't just have it your day. No, this wouldn't be out of the ordinary. This is like, you know, a lot of couples will put, like a lot of people are doing like very simplistic cakes now, like we did. Yeah. But a lot of people put like their names, their initials, their, you know, a heart, something on top of their wedding cake that signifies that it's theirs and it's their day or their, you know, married name, Mrs., Mr., whatever this is a temple on it so you can't just have your nice things you can't just have your no it be centered around you everything has to be centered around the temple and i'm not saying that the people who are participating in these things don't want it that way because that's what we wanted too. everything was centered around mormonism but when you're in it you don't see it that way yeah you're really not given a choice uh, like all the messaging surrounding everything when you're growing up in a, in Mormonism is that you want to go to the temple, you want to be married in the temple, you have to return to the temple often, like, and once we get into the text, like, the, the body, or, like, all the, the ceremony, actual ceremony, you'll see that it is, <laughs> it's not about you, really, it's, it's about Mormonism, like Jordan said. And you don't, and I'm not, there's going to be Mormons that come on here and are like, I wanted it that way. That's how I wanted my, and that's fine. That's fine. Because that's yeah, what we that's thought fine. we wanted to. But you look back on it now in a more objective lens and it does kind of come off a little weird. Okay. This one just takes me back to like mid 2000s. Okay. It's got backroom vibes, honestly. It does. It is. Remember when there was there was a time, a very Pinteresty time, where like the very pink, like almost orange apricot color, and then the aquamarine blue, like combining those two things together for wedding colors. That was that was all the rage for a minute. 
And that's what's happening here. In this one, uniquely, they have more like billowy curtain oh, things yeah. covering the top. Um, and notably, they have chair covers, which when you're trying to cover brown metal chairs is probably probably ideal. Probably the way to go. Um, but this is j- it. It's the gym floor and the uh, what do you call the little? It's not the paneling. It's the divider. Oh, the little the, um, the little accordion dividers yep. between. Uh, on the other side of that little divider is the chapel. So literally, that's all you have between. This is my wedding and Sunday service. Yep. <laughs> and then this one just about killed me. Oh, they tied a little knot in the tool. <laughs> oh God! Again, you guys, you've got to work with the basketball hoop sometimes. So these people decorated the basketball hoop, and to, it's like dressed to the nines on this one. I wow! I don't have words. It, they tried Full to make send. it into like a chandelier. Oh, okay, but there's I see like a a big ass backboard. <laughs> <laughs> the chandelier the, the dump truck backboard <laughs> of the basketball hoop so that doesn't really work and then last but not least i had to blur some things in here for people's privacy sake um but this is mormon wedding cringe at its finest right here we have couples that serve together stay together um, and it's two couples who both went on missions and they have all these cute little things together, including their mission journals that and both their, of them wrote in. Their little missionary plaques. Mm-hmm. And their name tags and yeah. This what is... look like prison cells mm-hmm. too. Oh yep. wait, are those they're milk crates. They're milk Sorry. crates, but it looks like kinda looks like a prison cell. Yep. So this is very cringe, but also very On brand, honestly. On brand for Mormonism. Yeah. Um, lots of couples that both served missions will take their little black missionary tags and like put them somewhere in their wedding decor. That's really not out of the realm of, yeah, of normalness. So now you have a little peek into wedding Mormon wedding culture. The other thing that we probably should have addressed when we were talking about the temple wedding schedule, typically ceilings happen first. So like in our case, we get sealed in the temple first and then you have lunch, reception, dinner, or whatever you want to do. And so for a lot of couples, there is a gap. There's some time between a morning ceiling and your dinner or reception. Now, mind you, your ceiling, when you are done with your ceiling, you are legally and religiously married by the God, by, by the Lord's standards. And so as soon as that ceiling is completed... Um, you're free to have sex without um, any sort of repercussions. Yeah. Church consequences. So when there is a gap <laughs> between the ceiling and the reception and there's some time or in between there. Any event, really. Yeah. Then it leaves some fun time in between. Um, so there are a lot of Mormon couples who it's kind of a cultural joke that a lot of Mormon couples will be late to their receptions or late to their lunches or dinners. Because they was getting it on. Yeah. Who are we? we got lost. Yeah. Who were we talking to that said that it was like literally at the luncheon venue? There was like a dressing room or something. New Oh, it was Kara. Kara Ooh. Burrell. <laughs> Sorry, Love Kara. You, Kara. <laughs> she has a TikTok about it, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Yeah. That makes it okay, then we'll share that. Yeah. But <laughs> you got to keep in mind that the, you know, Mormon engagements typically aren't long, you know, because people don't. People they don't want to slip up. They don't want to slip up. So their they're, dating's pretty quick. Engagement's pretty quick. And so because of that, by the time they get married, they're dying to do it, you know? And so yeah. they're they're ready to go. They like, got full license. They, they might as well just, you know, why not? It's true. Go for it. So the number one question after this segment is going to be, did you guys do that? And the answer is no. No. Jordan yeah. sent me to the hotel that we were staying at. Um with my best man and uh we were both dressed up pretty nicely so maybe they were thinking that we were checking into the room for ourselves <laughs> uh but uh jordan wanted to avoid any semblance of that so we had too much going on that day like yeah we there was did. no way we had our ceiling in the morning we had a lunch and then we immediately after that lunch had to head to the reception hall to set up 
all of our stuff to get our decorations, the cake, flowers, everything situated. And so really there was not enough time to do anything in that said period of time. Like I was, no. we were going like one thing after the other until our reception. And photos and everything. Yeah. yeah. It was Pictures cool and yeah, there was way too much for us to do that. So no, we did not do that. There was no <laughs> new time delight. No, no quickie before reception. So no, we did not do that. Let's move on to the actual ceiling portion. Um, there are a couple of things that are actually related to the ceiling that we need to talk about before we get into the actual ordinance or ritual. Um, first off, the endowment, like Jordan said, is done uh, before uh, a ceiling can be done. Uh, so this can be you know, days or weeks beforehand that you get this taken care of, which is probably recommended in most cases because it would make for an extra long day <laughs> having to do that. Um, we, I think we needed to be at the temple by like nine ish. We weren't even getting sealed until like 11. So that was interesting. And I can't imagine having to be at the temple by like seven in order to get everything situated, do a hour and a half hour, 45 long endowment session just to go right in to the ceiling, um, which is an option. People do do that. It's not recommended to sit no. through. If you haven't watched our endowment videos, they precede these ones and there's three videos because it's usually an hour and a half to a two hour ceremony. And so to sit in that for two hours and you're getting all this crazy culty shit thrown at you yeah. that you've never Traumatized seen Traumatized before. right before you get married. And not then ideal. you go into ceiling. Yeah, it's not. Not ideal. It's not, not ideal. They so, do not recommend that anymore. They say to either go like the week before or a few days yeah. before um, just to kind of give you some time to process things beforehand. That was not an issue for me because I had gotten endowed before McKay had yeah. even come back from his mission. So we didn't have to deal with that. Yeah, and I think it probably largely has to do with how busy the temple is at the Salt Lake City Temple. There was absolutely, they were rushing us to get everything going because they have so many weddings to do. It's like cows. It's, yeah, it's literally just getting herded everywhere you go. So if you do that, there are sometimes, um, depending on the temple, obviously, um, if there's space allowed for that, ceiling rooms that are attached to the celestial room your family members can go and do the endowment with you doing it for dead people at the same time as you're doing it for yourself so those people would be all dressed up in all their ceremonial clothing just like you so you wouldn't be special um and then other people if they didn't attend um, they would just have to be dressed in all white because you have to walk through the celestial room to get to those ceiling rooms um, otherwise, if you just had it done in advance, then those people would just be wearing, um, the, the handbook says what you would wear to sacrament in order to, uh, and they would just go through to a ceiling room that's not attached to a celestial room. That will make more sense in a minute. Yeah. We have touched on this in previous videos. Um, and a lot of you have left me comments and being like, what the hell? That doesn't make any sense. And so for a Mormon wedding dress, there are quite a bit of requirements in order for a Mormon, in order for a wedding dress to be eligible to go into the temple. So if you want to wear your wedding dress inside the temple, which is optional, because when you go through the temple, you have a regular white dress that you wear when you go to do work for dead people. Like you just have a regular white dress. So you can either wear that regular white dress when you get sealed or you can wear your wedding dress. But there are a lot of requirements that you have to check off. <coughs> in order to wear your wedding dress into the temple. The first, primarily, the biggest one being is it has to be white, white, like blinding you like Unnaturally white. With, with the whiteness, okay? It cannot be any shade of off-white. It cannot even be close to nude. It cannot, like, none of that, okay? It has to be, like, crazy white. Um, it obviously has to cover the garments, so there has to be some type of sleeve. Generally... Some temples are stricter than others, but it needs to be able to at least cover your garments. Yeah. Um, Another thing that was in the general handbook is that any sheer fabric has to be lined. So Jordan's sleeves, they went all the way, were they three quarter or all the way down? Three quarter. Um, they were mostly sheer. Um, 
What do you call that? They had fabric and texture sewn into it, but it was primarily sheer. And so because of that, and because they told me my dress wasn't white enough, and because I had a beaded belt on the dress that is too flashy for a myriad of reasons, they told me that my dress, I was not able to wear my dress into the ceiling room. And by that point, I did not even care. So it didn't matter. But there are a lot of things that you have to take into account if you're going to wear your wedding dress in. So any type of like bling, like any type of sequins, beading, all of those things are majorly frowned upon. There's not like a... I think they won't even allow them. They didn't with me because I had a tied in... You'll have to throw up a picture of my dress, but I had a tied in little belt that had sequin that had like beading on the front that was like super expensive. And because of that and eight other things that they didn't like, I wasn't able to wear it in the temple. So if you don't fit those requirements, you get to wear your regular old white dress. So that's why you want to get your endowment done beforehand. So that way you're at least set apart from everybody else because literally anything else is going to be just... Plain Jane, what you would wear in the temple, nothing special. On your wedding day, which is just... Kind of lame. Just awesome. Okay, from there, um, let's talk about the ceiling rooms. McKay will throw up some pictures of what the ceiling room looks like. It is like next to the celestial room in glory, essentially. They are extravagant. Um no expense was spared when yeah nice comfy chairs yeah like chandeliers like a mother at the center of the ceiling room is an altar and so similar to the altar that is at the front of the endowment room in our endowment videos it is the same altar and each ceiling room has one and then there are chairs that surround um the altar And then on the walls, notably one of the biggest, one of the most important aspects probably of the ceiling room is the mirrors that are on the walls. Um, The, on either side of the walls, they have these mirrors set up so that when the people are kneeling across the altar from each other, they can look at each other in these mirrors that seemingly go on for eternity, which is symbolism in that you're married for time and all eternity and it goes on forever and ever, even though eventually they kind of start to fade away because of imperfections, which maybe is an even better allegory, honestly. (laughs) For my uh, friends that are into or have some knowledge of occult type, witchy type, any of those things, I am not super involved in any of those things, but I have enough knowledge to know that pointing mirrors at each other is not, not the vibe is not generally something that you want to do. So keep in mind that this, the mirrors are directly pointed at each other in every single ceiling room in every single temple, and there are multiple ceiling rooms typically in each temple. So that's fun. Um, uh, also, the the altar has um, like in the endowment, like Jordan said, the padded little kneeling spaces. Uh, they do it all around the altar, and we'll get to that reasoning why in a little bit. Um, but yeah, so they get y'all dressed up and before you do anything, because Mormonism is a patriarchal order, you have to do the exchanging of the new name it's and not even an exchange, exchange. Yeah. kind of implies that it goes both ways, but it doesn't. Um, so what you do, um, we did this, it was really weird and we had to wait for f- ever for the people in the endowment room to be done. Um, But they take you in. The man goes on the Lord's side of the veil, and then they bring uh, the the bride around to the little peon side of the veil. Mind you, we're talking about the veil in the context of the endowment ceremony that you watched in the last video. So make sure you've seen this. So once you go, like when you go to the end, you go up to the big ass curtains, and it has the holes in it that you like exchange hands between. This is what we're talking about. So I would be like the man like the lord i put my hand through the veil and i take jordan by the first token of the the ironic priesthood like that and i'd say what is that go through the thing and then she gives me her new name so the name that was given to me in the temple when i went through for myself the name that they tell you you can't tell anyone and you have to keep secret well, fun fact you keep it secret until you get married and then you have to tell your husband 
but that only goes one way. So I have to tell McKay what my new name is, which was Phoebe, by the way. I liked my new name. Phoebes. And he does not tell me his ever. Nope. There is Until never. The day I die. Never. Not even then. Yep. It's like after, after you're dead and the world's hereafter, the life hereafter. I don't even think you would after that. It's when you call me when I'm dead and you call me from the grave by my new name, like 5,000, 500,000 yeah. other Phoebes would so I can bring rise you through up. the veil. So. The army of the Phoebes, you'd have to decide which was which. <laughs> so there is no point during your regular normal Mormon life where you would learn your husband's new name. Ever. Ever. But I knew Jordan's. And to the up until the day that we decided to leave the church, I never, ever told Jordan what my new name was. Nope wasn't that until we left the church so they have you do that little weird thing and it's literally just that it takes about five minutes if that do i pull you through the veil yes i don't even remember honestly but it's yeah weird. you did i feel honestly like did. it was traumatic it was freaky it's weird well and they at first when you're in the like when you're getting ready they take you they take the the woman back to the bride's room and you get all ready and everything and then once you're ready to get sealed, you have to put on all the clothes. You have yeah. to put on the ceremonial clothes. And so, mind you, it really doesn't matter what dress you're wearing in the temple because it's going to look f***ing stupid no matter what you do because you're wearing a green apron over the top of it. Right? So. And so they they keep you apart until a certain point And then they bring you, like McKay and I, to each other dressed in our ceremonial clothes. And it's the stupidest shit ever. It's like, oh, I've never seen... I couldn't even picture you in that. <laughs> it was so awkward. I remember when they did that to us the first time. Yeah. They just, like, shoved us it's in like, a room and were like, here. It was so awkward. Do you remember that? Yeah. So they put you in the... Like, you change into your ceremonial clothes. You put them all on top of the... The white dress, the white suit, and then they put you in the celestial room until you're ready to go to the ceiling room. Now, while you're waiting, the two of us are just chilling in the celestial well, we room. We were just waiting to go to do the veil. Yeah. Yeah. And then we went straight to the ceiling. Yes. Because they have to load all your family members into the ceiling room. They got to herd them in. <laughs> they got to herd them in like cattle. And so we're, you know, we're doing the name exchange and waiting for everybody to get situated in the ceiling room so that by the time we're ready, it's super awkward because when you go in there, everybody's already sitting down. Yep. And you're just like, hey. Uh, the person who does the ceiling is called the sealer. Shocker, right? Um, he is very special. Not any random person who does work in the temple. Basically, anybody who is endowed can work in the temple, but only the ceiling. He has a special calling and a special ordination in the priesthood that he has priesthood keys so that he can perform the ordinance, um, which is unique. Um, usually they're like uh, called by the prophet himself, but... Yeah, they're supposed to be really big, but so there's only a few sealers per temple, and most of the time you don't know them, and you don't get to pick them, unless you know them personally, which is pretty rare. Yeah, so the sealer who you don't know, he just like, before he brings you in, he just kind of gives you a little thing, just talks to you about the sealing, maybe tries to learn your names so he doesn't fuck them up in the ordinance. Maybe. But I don't. I could not even tell you what he said to me. I don't even know the guy's name. It is the most impersonal thing that has ever happened to me. I do remember when you're, because you're, you're standing in the hallway outside of the ceiling room talking to this dude in your stupid ceremonial clothes. So he look, he's just in a white suit, looking like a mostly normal human being, and yeah. you look like f***ing chefs standing outside in the hallway talking to this guy. And I do remember that he did say, they emphasize, and you'll learn this in the ceremony in a minute, there's no I do, like in a traditional wedding. It's not like a, do you take I do? There's none of that. You have to say yes, and only yes. There is no I do, because they try to really distinguish themselves from a regular wedding ceremony. Yeah. And so he told us before we even went in there that it's yes, not I do. So make sure you say yes. I do remember that. Okay. I don't even remember that because that's, I mean, if you've seen the, the videos that we did about the temple, it, it's yes everywhere. Mm -hmm. You bow your head and you say yes. Um, so, so he takes you in 
awkward. Everybody's sitting down, and then he sets you down in the Salt Lake City Temple was just a couch. Um, and your mom was closest to you, and my mom was closest to me, mm-hmm. sitting next to us on chairs. On I guess it's more like a love seat, really. And then he basically just kind of gives his own little version of a sermon, <laughs> really, talking about how, oh, when I remember specifically, he was like, when you guys kneel to pray as the the, <laughs> the married couple for your first time in your lives, I was like, dude, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Especially <laughs> now, <laughs> not after the, the nasty stuff we're going to do later. No, I'm just kidding, but. That was definitely not the first thing on my mind was kneeling with my dear wife in prayer and before we go to bed. <laughs> the level, you guys, if I could, I truly cannot explain to you the level of awkwardness that you feel going through this ceremony because all of your family members are sitting there in regular church clothes. Yep. They are not in, in your, ceremonial clothes. You're in your regular, yeah, you're... You're decked out. Ceremonial shit. It's- Apron, chef's hat, veil. You're decked out in all this shit that makes you look absolutely insane. And then all your friends and family members are just sitting there together around you, staring at you because there's nothing else to look at. And they're just staring at you because you're the center of the, in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, there's liter- there's nowhere to look. That's not unless you're looking down. It's so awkward. So they sit you across from each other. So McKay's on one side of the altar. I'm on the other And then he gives his little speech. But the awkwardness is palpable because I can't even make eye contact with anyone in that room because 90% of the people that were at our ceiling, other than like really close family members, had never seen us like in these outfits, nor had I seen them in anything like that. Yeah. So when you're sitting there like that and they're just staring at you, it's so freaking awkward to try to be like, this is a special Hello. moment, and I'm taking this seriously because you just feel so out of place. Yeah. And how are you supposed to feel like it's a special moment for you? It's just like, especially because I had done ceilings otherwise I uh, for dead people. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't even like a unique experience, really. No. Um, so, So we're yeah. sitting across from each other, and the dude starts to talk. The other important thing about this process is you have, you have to have witnesses, just like we talked about in the baptism, how there has to be, um, there can be women witnesses now. That is not the case in ceilings. No. The, uh, yeah, the people who are witnessing, traditionally you will get a person from the bride's side of the family and a groom's side of the family, but they have to be a Melchizedek priesthood holding male. Obviously with the temple recommend worthy to be there. Yeah. And so, so they sit in chairs on opposite sides of the sealer. The sealer. He usually gets like a higher back chair. So you know he's the sealer like, and he has this little this little sliding desk that he brings in so he can read your names and everything like that and the little script. Um, and then his little witnesses are like, it's like a little trinity. Like God yeah, and it's weird. It's weird. But um, so... Yeah, Jordan didn't have, my dad did because he was a member and Jordan had to find a family member to be able to be the witness. I had to go to an extended family member. Um, these are also the people who would be the witnesses for to sign your marriage c- certificate. So it's all kind of in that same vein. Um, but there is a script that this guy reads. He doesn't know you, so he can't really throw anything personal in there in a lot of cases. Um, so he... S- has you kneel down, um, and then you each take each other across the altar. We're kneeling across the altar, and you take each other by the second token of the Melchizedek priesthood, the patriarchal grip or the sure sign of the nail, which looks like this, where you uh, place your finger where the nail and the sure place is when Jesus was crucified. Um, so... You do that. That is probably the sole reason why people who are unendowed aren't allowed to attend because you are showing one of the tokens of the Melchizedek priesthood. You're showing one of the handshakes to get into heaven. So that's, they don't want you that's what's the keeping everybody else out. <laughs> that's some bullshit, honestly. Uh, imagine if like, you just gave it in code and you're like, take each other by the token and nobody would no know what you're know. talking about. So it wouldn't matter. It's probably matter. the clothes though too. I mean, yeah, maybe, but honestly, it all just seems like a way to exclude people, which is bullshit. It's true. Anyway, 
So he goes on and he reads this script. So he says to the groom, he looks straight at him. You can't really look at each other because he's looking at you and talking to you. So he looks at me and he says, brother blank, do you take sister blank by the right hand and receive her unto yourself to be your lawfully wedded wife for time and all eternity with a covenant and promise that you will observe and keep all the laws, rights, and ordinances pertaining to his holy order of matrimony in the new and everlasting covenant. And this you do in the present of God, angels, and these witnesses of your own free will and choice. So that kind of echoes some of the uh, the endowment wording. So this is the part where you don't say I do, you say yes. So I said yes, and then he turns to your lovely wife, lovely in my case, and he says the following. It is the same thing, sister blank, do you take brother blank by the right hand to give yourself to him and be his lawfully wedded wife, and the rest of it is the same. So emphasizing um, your own free will and choice, to which I would respond, yes. And then there's the little bit at the end. He says, by virtue of the holy priesthood and the authority vested in me, I pronounce you blank and blank, legally and lawfully husband and wife for time and all eternity. And I seal upon you the blessings of the holy resurrection with power to come forth in the morning of the first resurrection, clothed in glory, immortality, and eternal lives. I seal upon you the blessings of kingdoms, thrones, principalities, powers, dominions, and exaltations with the blessings of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and say unto you, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth that you may have joy and rejoicing in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. All these blessings together with all the blessings are appertaining to the new and everlasting covenant, side note, which is outlined in Doctrine and Covenants section 132 in uh, LDS canonized scripture. I seal upon you that by virtue of the holy priesthood through your faithfulness in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, amen. So that's kind of also the same language that they use throughout the ceiling uh, or all the other ceremonies. So that's it. That's it. Um, Usually, (laughs) and I've only ever attended, let's see, two other ceilings before my own. Um, They will ask you, oh, let's see a kiss across the altar, which is f***ing weird. so awkward. And uh, in all three situations, except for mine, or the two situations prior, because you're awkwardly just oh this weird thing happened and everybody's been watching me and we're in these weird ass clothes it's usually like the most lifeless kind of peck over the altar because it's weird and then he's like oh is that all you got let's see a real kiss like oh dude uh so side note when that came around to me i was like i'm gonna give jordan the heaviest smooch i possibly can because i'm going to avoid I'm going to avoid the embarrassment of having him tell me to do it again. So I don't know what's more cringe, having him say, (laughs) do it again, or like basically tugging your newly wedded spouse down over an altar in the temple. So they didn't ask us to do it twice. That's fun. Um, After that, if you have agreed to do so, you can exchange rings um, right there. Not really anything special. I Mm -hmm. struggled to put it on Jordan's finger because I was nervous. Um, But in the general handbook, it says that is the only time you are allowed to do it if you have agreed to do it. You cannot do it anywhere else in the temple or on the temple grounds. It has to be done during your reception or whatever. Yeah. So. They're really weird about it. Yeah. Yeah. The the neck the really only redeeming part of this whole very impersonal ordinance because that's it after you've done the scene the thing they like everybody walks by you going out and then once everybody's filtered out then you go your separate ways and get dressed so that you can exit which is the like it's the moment the only personal time that you've had all day where people are focused on you. Um, it's the big temple exit. So it is the Mormon moment. It is the Mormon moment. If you've ever seen, and I wish I, I wish I could share ours with you, but but I really care about the identity of a lot of people that we know and love. So I'm not going to do that. Um, but if you've ever seen a Mormon temple video, 
like a lot of people do, like we did. This is the moment where they walk out of the temple and everybody cheers, even though you're not supposed to because you're on the temple grounds. But people do it anyway. And yeah, you throw that door open and I grab Jordan by the hand and we threw our arms up and we're like, yay, we just experienced the cultiest experience of our lives. Yay. Yep. And everybody shouts and everybody comes and hugs you and you take pictures and then you go off and do your, your reception and everything. That's it. That's the ceiling. That's it. It was, we, I mean, we talked a lot about other things, but. <laughs> the say, like the ritual itself is very quick in terms of um, you, this isn't the only time that you will do ceilings. It's the only time that you'll do a ceiling for yourself um, unless you get remarried and circumstances are different, but you do go just as with the endowment. Once you've done it for yourself, you go and do it for other people. And so when you go to the temple, one of the options that you have instead of doing the endowment or the initiatory is doing ceilings and you, so you and someone else represent a dead man and a dead woman who need to be sealed together. So yeah. you can do that ordinance for dead people as a couple. And we did yeah. that a lot. Or a dead man, a dead woman and a child. Child. Um, um, so that's another thing that I, I wanted to add is that some families, uh, they have children before they get sealed. So whatever circumstance that might may be, maybe they got baptized in the church when they already had kids or something like that. Um, really notably like those big Mormon family vlogger channels on YouTube, like not enough Nelson's crazy pieces, crazy middles where they've adopted children who they want to have sealed to them in the church. This is the only time where children under age kids, um, above the age of eight would be able to enter the temple and see somebody that's dressed in the temple ceremonial clothing mm -hmm. and be there when they do the uh, the patriarchal grip. Um, so it's kind of all the same situation. Kids don't get dressed up in any of the ceremonial clothing, obviously. Um, they just get dressed in all white. They have to, like I said, be baptized and confirmed already. And uh, they have to have a worthiness interview and get a temple recommend Children. with their bishop. Children age of eight you can do this um but the the situation is kind of the same where um one or more kids would be with you to get sealed to their their parents um, that's why they have the padding all the way around the altar so the parents will kneel across the altar from each other take each other by the patriarchal grip just like if they were getting married and the kids will put their hands on top of their parents hands that is in the patriarchal grip um, and then it just goes on. It's a little different, but not really. Yeah. So this is what they read. <laughs> <laughs> By the authority of the Holy Priesthood, I seal you, the children, to your father, blank, and to your mother, blank, for time and all eternity, as an heir or heirs, as though you were born in the new and everlasting covenant, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's all they get. Like, literally, not even, th it's three sentences, right? Two or three sentences. Mm -hmm. That's all they get. And then you just fuck off i guess like <laughs> go take pictures or whatever so, so the idea is everyone is sealed to everyone back to adam basically yeah. um there's that scripture in malachi turning the hearts of the fathers to the children and um also notably uh matthew 16 19 is kind of another scripture that they use to justify the sealing um, but other than that, it's all really contained in Doctrine and Covenants 132, um, which outlines the new and everlasting covenant of marriage and also polygamy, which is not Fun redacted fact. doctrine. It is still Mormon doctrine. Um, so, yeah, all those all those big families that you see that adopt children, they do this. They bring their kids into the temple and it's a huge deal, just like they do for for baptism and everything like that, because you're now an eternal family you're now equal to all those other families that had their parents got married and their children were born into the covenant and, and everything like that. So, so just to be clear, you wouldn't need to have your children sealed to you. Like in my Kay and I situation, because we got married in the temple, any children that we would have are automatically sealed to us because we were sealed yep. to each other before they were born. Yeah. So the, the, I, I probably said it before, but born into the covenant is what they call it. So we wouldn't have had to take our child, taken our child to do this ordinance because they were already born under that covenant. They're already sealed to us. 
Um, so it, it's kind of, I mean, the the culture. I will I will blame it on the culture, even though it's kind of systemic. Is that kids who are born under the covenant are more faithful because their parents chose to be faithful and get married in the temple. And people will say, no, that's not the case, blah, blah, blah. But really, that's the messaging. Um, like, my um, my patriarchal blessing, and we've talked about that before. You can probably check out right there. Um, it specifically s- talked about being born under the covenant and being righteous enough to be in that situation. So when you're talking about children who have been adopted and they're not born under the covenant because their parents, you know, they they met their parents later on in life, it's kind of obvious that they're going to be viewed as less than in a lot of cases, which really sucks. It's very rude. Yeah. But, I mean, there's really nothing. That That's what it is. So... They it's they say it's made up because you're doing the ordinance now, so anything before that doesn't matter, but it's still culture that's going to remain for I don't even know how long. I think that about sums it up as far as the ceiling goes. I think the longest ceiling I've ever heard of was like 45 minutes to an hour, and this is why, because yeah, literally following the ordinance, things that need to be said you wouldn't really have to spend any time on it. Yeah. If you're just like riffing, your you sealer's a sealer, just like yeah. doing whatever. Yeah. Honestly, he can say whatever he wants. He, he doesn't have to get approval from you or anything like that. So, so he's that's just, why it's longer sometimes. Just rambling or whatever. Uh, but yeah, really impersonal, really focused on just the religion, really exclusionary for anybody that's not part of the in-group, uh, mm-hmm. which is really damaging in the long run. Uh, I don't think that has ever motivated anybody to do something to get that changed. It's probably just pushed people away. It's true. So this kind of completes the Temple series, the official Temple This is like series, the first series really. we've ever really completed. Really, yep. Where we're like, yep, this is it. <laughs> um, we will do, uh, this one probably won't be next week. We might have to do a little more deep diving into it than we can. Because this is uh, the second anointing. We have not witnessed. There is really not a lot of official material that you can pull from. Um, There's a lot of hearsay and there's a lot of secrecy surrounding it because the average Mormon is never going to attain the second anointing. So if you watched our previous video and if you listen to our Mormon stories podcast interview that will be out next week, I will discuss why the second anointing broke my shelf. Yeah. So. So listen to that. Go over to youtube.com slash Mormon stories on Wednesday, sounds like, and uh, listen to Jordan's Mormon story and you can find out a little bit of a teaser before we talk about it. If you liked what you heard today, there was a little bit of rambling, but uh, we're just going with it uh, and you're not subscribed already, please consider hitting that subscribe button. It helps us out a lot. Um, we love to hear from you. If you have any comments, leave them in the comments section. If you're just listening, um, definitely shoot us an email at jordanmckay at gmail.com. If you would like to support us, you can go to patreon.com slash jordanandmckay and you can become one of our beautiful patrons and fund some new audio equipment. Uh, they are helping me. It's just kind of a matter of time. We love all of them. I'm doing a new little Patreon tribute right now so thank you everybody we love you all very um, much. we wanted to change it up and make sure we got everyone it's easier to do it on a weekly basis rather than just having a little slide at the end of Y'all everything deserve it anyway uh you're all awesome we love our patrons they are amazing and you can we will be posting in patreon this week beginning week of february yeah this week we will post and allow our patrons to pick one of our topics for the month of february awesome so make sure if you would like to pick one of our topics make sure you join us on there we're taking a a page out of the old jenonism book (laughs) book of youtube virtues i guess you could say plus it helps us because we kind of suck at making decisions sometimes yeah so so it's nice to hear from everybody um If you'd like to join our Discord, it is an easy way to get in contact with us. Uh, The link is in the description on our YouTube videos. That's an easy way to find it. Also, you can find us on social media 
on TikTok and Instagram at Jordan and McKay. Um, pretty straightforward. You can find all those links in the description as well. If you've made it this far, thank you for hanging on and we love you and we'll see you next time.